like to say shalom on this morning to all uh, those Israelite brothers and sisters. I'd like to say peace to our Christian brothers and sisters of what's up, what's happening, what it brew, what it do uh, to all the other brothers and sisters uh, throughout throughout this city, Kansas City, Missouri, and throughout the the world at large. To our Kansas City brothers, uh, to our Kansas City brothers, our brothers in Kansas City, Missouri, we have uh, gotten word that two more of our close related family members and brothers have uh, passed away. Uh, one of them is our brother-in-law, um, Willie D. Randolph. But many of the brothers and sisters in Kansas City, Missouri know this is my brother-in-law's brother. And we all grew up together. And then we had a brother that we worked with. Uh, Brother Fur, he was also, he also frequented uh, many of the, uh, many of the black cowboy functions. And uh, like I said, we worked together for the Kansas City, Missouri School District as well. And so uh, we want to be mindful to keep these families lifted up in prayer. See, even as we still remember our brother Anthony Arnold, uh, we know that when we lose loved ones, when we lose loved ones, there is no opportunity. There is no opportunity to go back and do anything. There is no opportunity to go back and visit nobody, to go back and visit the sick. Now, mind you, I'm telling you something because we've been dealing with a set of videos that have been dealing with not swearing. Not swearing, not taking the uh, Most High's name in vain. And basically what that means is that, is that uh, it doesn't matter that the Most High... Yah, God, Jesus, Yahawashai, Yahshua. It matters not how much those names are on our lips. What matters is that the people who have the name on their lips become the embodiment of the things that 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 the Father has called us to do, one way or the other. Uh, when we was in the world, we were able to go out there and live our life. I think I might going to have to recap this video. No, I ain't going to recap it. I'm going to let it roll. I'm about to cut my nephew's hair, but I'll keep talking. Yeah, I'll keep talking. Yeah, so um, so um, what we were saying is that... Good morning, nephew. When we was when we was what the church people call in the world, we was living. We was living. We was going places. We was doing all sorts of things, and, uh, and we didn't have no names on our lips because we was just living. And I think that the things that we got to got to relearn all over again. How do I live in this world? How do I live in this world and just conduct myself by the things that I know to do? Uh, opposed to just talking about it as a means to persuade people of what it is that I'm believing in. So, as I said before, once people die, you don't have no opportunity ever to go back and fix anything that you have done wrong for anybody. It's all over. And no, none of us know when our time going to expire. Today could be my last day. It could be your last day. It could be the last day of somebody that you love. It could be the last day of somebody that you had a fellowship with. It could be the last day to uh, go back and tell somebody that you made a mistake. You apologize. And uh, as quiet as it's kept. And this is just anybody that falls into the into the uh, those things that you believe in because you live in a world that everybody don't believe the same thing and that's one of the reasons why the book telling us don't be swearing in my name most high created all the people on the planet everybody that's on the planet everybody's <coughs> everybody that's on the planet coming to the world the exact same way they come into the world through the womb that the Most High ordained that will bring forth life. Now, 
we using the most highs when we when we doing teaching or something of that nature on Facebook or YouTube. But when you just sitting down having a conversation with somebody, you got to be able to live in this world and have cohesiveness and agreement with people that don't share the same ideology as you. Otherwise, can't, you ain't going to get done what you're supposed to get done. And, uh, and heritage has become as guilty as our brothers and sisters that are in Christianity. Because this is where this is where we learn how to swear by the name. You see? Because ain't no perfect people on the planet. Ain't no people on the planet that don't have a level of shame. Ain't no people on the planet that don't have no sin in their life. And so by that standard, that's where our common ground ultimately comes from. The ground don't come or the thing, areas that we don't struggle in. Our common ground comes from the fact that we all have a level of shame in our life. And then on top of that, we also have common ground in other areas, namely this area, that ain't none of us, uh, the vast majority. Only those that make it to the end of time when, when what we have come to learn through what we believe, whether you're Christian or Israelite, uh, is when the Messiah come back. Those people that are still living on the earth, those are the people that, that won't immediately. But other than that, our common ground comes from the fact that all of us are going to die. And when we do die, we all going to die with some type of level of shame. Go nine out of ten times. Came some things. We know that the book says that it's appointed the man wants to die, and then after that is judgment for him. But the reality is that everybody don't believe what your book say. <laughs> Everybody don't believe what your books say. But even the people that don't believe what your books say, they understand this fact because this is a living factor that just takes place amongst all the people on the earth that are living. Even the people that don't have no type of religiosity or no type of religious background, uh, they have a comprehension of this because it's a thing that takes place on the earth that are living. And so... You know, it's going to be time for all of us to sleep in the dust. The only problem is, is that who's going next? But we do know if we live long enough that we all going to go. So, so we want to uh, just keep the brothers and sisters encouraged to uh, live, try to live amongst the brothers in a way that, that keeps you connected without doing a great deal of damage. Okay, now many people think that they that they have some type of cake or some type of monopoly. You know how you how you feel like you have a monopoly on the Most High's program because you think anybody that ain't doing what you're doing is wrong or crooked. But the reality, I mean, are wrong. All of us are crooked. All of us are crooked. Truly, you believe something. Just because you believe it, it don't make it what you believe. So everybody had the capacity to do the same thing. Everybody gonna believe in something. So, but as we said before, the Bible says, and this is one of the areas that Christianity have done a great injustice when it comes to teaching our people. Now. And when we start talking about these different things, uh, our brothers that are Christian, they take these things personal. Well, you shouldn't be taking anything personal. You should be listening to what's being said so that you can comprehend. Just because you go to church and just because you call yourself a Christian don't give you no monopoly on, 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 on this life that we're living. It don't give you no monopoly on what the Most High said he was going to do. It don't give you no monopoly on the future or it don't give you no, no monopoly on the welfare of the souls of men. 
just because they don't go to your church. And it's a sad, sick, twisted reality when you feel like that. And the vast majority of our Christian preachers have lost the ability to identify with anybody that don't believe what it is that they believe. Not just in Christianity, it's the same thing that's happening with our Israelite brothers. It's almost like you think that there's a monopoly on something uh, that you believe. So, what it do is it really stop you from being able to, uh, it really stop you from being able to be effective. Whatever it is that you're supposed to be getting done. So, so that's so as soon as I get through video back up now so quote well it's not a scripture but it's something that was spoken spoken by the self-proclaimed apostle uh the paul it said it's a point of time, and then after that is judgment so it don't make no difference ain't no man know what's waiting on him after he died Outside of somebody that had already died. But the problem is. Is that the people that have died. They ain't coming back. So they couldn't come back and tell you. Whether all the things that they was believing. Was true or not. Now we know. That according to the faith. Thank you, thank you nephew. We know that according to the faith. According to the faith. Tell your mama. I said what's up. Okay. All right. All right. I'll see you later. See you later. Now, we know that according to the faith that we believe, we say that Mashiach, he was the one that died and came back. Yet, we ain't never seen, not, we ain't never seen him in person. You never had the opportunity to ask him a question. Only thing you have is secondhand information. And and with our secondhand information, we believe those things by faith. But there is a level of uncertainty because you don't know what awaits you. Now, when we look at what the books say, it's appointed to a man wants to die. And then after this, there is judgment. That means that every man that passes from life to death enters into judgment next. So you have to ask yourself the question, well, what am I going to be being judged for? I'm going to be being judged based on whether I allowed my life to exemplify the Father's righteousness or whether it was just exemplified through my speech and behind the scenes. You know what I mean? There was no major, there was no major changes. Now, why am I talking about these things? Because these are the things that plague me on a day-to-day -day basis. And if it happened to me, and I've been reading the Bible for all of these years, and I'm sure that somebody else going to get the same type of thing. So, so being conscious of how we living uh, amongst each other, that's going to be very important. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm saying. Let's say, for instance, you go out and you open up a business. And... You do what? Let's see. What can I use for a good example? Let's say you go out and open up a business or start up a magazine like like what we seen on the news the other day. Christian Today magazine. Okay, that magazine will only have the capacity to reach the people that believe in it. But all of the people that believe in it, that don't give them no monopoly. Because it ain't no guarantee that what you believe in is, is the grand sum total or the totality of the most highest truth. So what you'll do is that you'll stagnate any growth or any discipleship or any true uh, impact that you're going to have on the world simply because you have chose to swear by the most high's name. And only those people that do the same thing that you do will come now and identify with your organization, but you will not be able to have impact where it comes to the people that might believe in Buddhism, Judaism, Israelite heritage. Uh, secularism, atheism, 
monotheism, humanism, all of these different worldviews that are in the earth, you will lose the ability to impact the world in the way that the Most High mean for his people to have an impact. How are you going to impact a world that don't believe what you believe when you try to put a monopoly on what it is that you believe? And anybody that don't believe what you believe, they are shut out. There is no way possible for you to operate in your true function. We know that when we skip over to Israelite heritage and Israel was told that you shall be. Speak now unto the children of Israel. That's Exodus 18, 19 chapter. Speak now to the children of Israel and tell them if they will hearken to my voice and obey my covenant, then indeed they shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people. For all the earth is mine and they shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Now, Here's a second example. When he spoke those words, he spoke those words to a particular people. He spoke to Israel. So therefore, Christi, the person that calls himself a Christian, he can't identify with that. Because if he is ever going to be a part of the thing that the Most High spoke, then it's going to come, he's going to come in there by way of the person that the Most High spoke to. Him. But notice how it is. Just because he spoke that to Israel does not give Israel a monopoly on the father's program because the father's program was that this particular people would become the ministerial of the ministerial tool for the rest of the world. Now, how can how can the Israelite impact anybody else in the world that do not understand what belongs to him. If the only people that he will associate with is the people that believe what he is, then he has stagnated and dwarfed his own growth. Thereby, when it's time for him to die, the Most High is going to bring him in the judgment based on the things that he had told, instructed him to do. Now, if you can't get along and have cohesiveness or find a way to strategically have cohesiveness with the people outside of Israelite heritage, if you can't have cohesiveness with those that's outside of what you're doing without bringing in what you believe, your impact, you ain't going nowhere. You might be a powerhouse within your house or within your community, but when it comes to getting the wheel that's been set to the side, for you to get done, you will be a complete failure because ultimately your responsibility is to reach them that believe in all of these different er er other world views. So the question is, how are you going to do it? This is what the this is what the European title and came known as apologetics. What apologetics was is apologetics was understanding that that there are many world views. In this world that we live in. Because there are many people on the planet. Now if you genuinely believe. That you have been set apart for a specific reason. Now your responsibility is to reach these people. That don't know anything about what you believe. And if you think for one minute. That because you believe the Bible. You can take the Bible to the person that believes in Buddha. And you can impact him or change his life. You're sadly mistaken. No, you have to find a way to have cohesiveness and common ground with people that don't believe what you believe and let the righteousness of the word come out of your life without ever swearing by the name. Because Israel ain't got no monopoly on the Most High's righteousness. How does the wise man die? He died the same way that the fool died. Both of them go to the same place. You see, if we go to the same place as the animals go, as the beasts go. Why are we saying this? We're saying this because we got people dying every day. You're going to lose some family members. And because of what brothers believe, that have drawn wedges between family members that the Most High said you're supposed to love no matter what. Once them people die, you don't have a second chance to go back 
and say, I'm sorry. When them people die, you don't have another opportunity to, to understand that, hey, you know what? I should have just been loving you. I should have just been letting the word and letting the most high's mercy and his grace and all of those things that I say that I believe in. I should have been letting those things come out of my life instead of allowing what I'm believing to draw a wedge between people. I believe that if you truly the people of God, whether you call yourself a Muslim whether you call yourself a Christian, whether you call yourself an Israelite, I believe if you truly, if you truly believe that you are the people of God, then love will become the overriding factor that will climb over the hurdle of all indifference. Because you can say at the end of your life and you go to the funeral, there will be many people possibly depending on the type of person that you was, that will come and visit. And some will have things to say. But the vast majority will come from different walks of life. Some will come from people that you worked with. Some will come from people that you worshiped with. Some will come from people that, that you lived with, maybe on your block or in your neighborhood. Some will come from people that knew you from the streets or going out. Some will come from all of the different activities that you used to do. And then they will notice different things about you. You see? But now, you're going to have some people. I've been to some funerals that when they give the people an opportunity to talk, nobody gets up and says anything. I wonder why that is. But then I've been to some funerals to where you have so many people that get up and speak on behalf of a particular individual that the preacher had to cut off the time so that he can get the message across. Now, when I look at just this past funeral that I just went to with our brother Anthony Arnold. Now, I met Anthony Arnold through, through the... Uh, through the, the cowboy events. We learned as children how to ride and how to care for horses. And, and as I got older and got grown, then we came in contact with this brother here. And that's where I knew him from. I never knew nothing about his faith. I never knew nothing about what he believed. I never knew nothing about what church he went through. Only thing that I knew is that I never seen anything outside of expression of love, not just for what he was doing, but for the people that we was doing it with. Then you find out that, that here's people that came from the corporate world, and you find out that this brother was the president of this association. And then you find out that the brother was doing something over here. And then you find out that the brother was doing something over there. But not one person was able to identify that while he was doing those things, he was getting on their nerves, always quoting scripture and always talking about what he was believing and things like that. See, that what I'm talking about, I'm talking about fruit coming out of your life in a way that we got to learn how to live again. I had to tell myself that you got to learn how to live again, boy. You got to learn how to live again. You spend so much time in the scripture, dissecting the word and this and that and the other. You need to learn how to live again. So you know what? I start learning how to live again because when I had lost the ability to live, that means that I was swearing by the most high's name everywhere that I went. And sometimes I was swearing by the most high's name. Well, you know, Jesus, he, you know, I'm the Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And, and I believe that, that, you know, it's like this because men is this and God is, it, see, I, and all of that stuff. Sometimes you're dealing with people that don't even know what you know, don't even believe what you believe in. And what it did is it stopped you from being able to live amongst your peers. It takes nothing away from what you believe. Because you're not talking about it. What you're now doing is you're trying to learn how to live by what it is that you believe for the sake of being able to have cohesiveness and identify 
with our brothers and sisters. But when we start looking at it being appointed to a man who wants to die, and then after that comes the judgment, the judgment is coming so that all of the things can be played back to us where our righteousness was concerned, okay? Because you know what? I ain't got the, you know what? The main thing that matters is that I talk to the Most High on a daily basis in the confines of my own spirit as it relates to the own things, to the personal things that I'm going through and to the things that have been carved out for me to do. I don't just go out and use that's like a man telling his wife on a daily basis, hey, you know, I love you. Hey, you know, I love you. Like like this example right here. Or, you know, hey, I love you, girl. Hey, I love you, girl. Hey, I love you, girl. But there never is no expression of that love except with words. And so the same way that a woman would be turned out by saying, well, well if you love me, why you don't treat me like you love me? If you really love me, why you don't do this? And let me tell you something. These are some good examples because I've been married to my wife for 18 years. I know in my heart that I love her. But I understand this. I can tell her that I love her. That's not what's going to get it. I have to let my love for her become the embodiment of my actions because I like any other man have heard his wife say from time to time, Hey, you know, I just don't, you know, you just don't treat me like you treat everybody else. You nice to everybody else. You kind to everybody else, but it seemed like you don't have that same type of mercy and compassion for me. Other people you have long patience with, but it seemed like your patience is short sometime with me. And like, I get on your nerves where other people, that's worse off, don't. These are some good examples. You got to live with this stuff. And if you really, if you really sincere and true and honest, and you can see these same things, I know you can. We have to go back and reevaluate it. And so you have to learn how to live again without words. You have to learn how to let your, your actions exemplify the words that you believe without spewing them out because you won't be able to have common ground with those other people, with those other people that the Most High is telling you to reach. I see my, I see my young king, King Moshe, on the line, and we had a conversation about this even as it relates to his gifted area with the music. And just like I told him, if the Most High truly giving you the gift of music, then what you believe, let that become the embodiment of the words that you put on wax, not the swearing by the name all the time. If you believe that you are walking in righteousness, then you put your righteous acts and your righteous deeds in the word. You don't always have to speak the most high's name because what happens when you do that is now you leave room for other people that don't believe what you believe to now be able to identify with the words that you are saying that are coming out of the righteous acts of your life. You're not trying to persuade nobody. Because when a Hebrew only use that Hebrew word stuff, you can best believe you're not having no contact, no impact on anybody that's outside of what it is that you believe in. And if that be the case, there's no way possible for you to fulfill the will that the Most High put Israel in the earth to do. Because many people say, well, we're the chosen people of God. We're the chosen people of God. Well, I ask you the question, what have you been chosen for? If you don't understand these simplistic principles, what have you been chosen for? When you look at the reason that the Messiah raised Israel back up, Isaiah chapter 49 verse 6 says, it's a light thing that I should use you to restore uh, the preserve uh, the preserved of Jacob and raise up the house of Israel. I also will give thee unto the Gentiles for a light that you'll be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. How in the world that you can be chosen for anything when you're completely turned off by the Gentiles and the people that's outside of you? He said, now it was just one, if I had one purpose 
when I raised you up. So to the brothers and sisters that you say you gloating about who you are, you gloating about Yah, you gloating about being Israel, understand that you've been raised up for one reason, and that is that through, through Mashiach, you will become a light to all of the Gentiles and all of the people that's outside. So when you look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go now into all the world and make disciples out of men, teaching them to observe whatsoever things that I observe you. Now, when you're teaching people to observe the things that have been learned from the Messiah, one of the things that should have been learned was, thou shall not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. You don't have to use my name. All you have to do is exemplify what my name embodies by living by the things that I have taught you to observe. That's where the problem is laying. We don't know how to live by the things that we've been taught to observe. Or we know how to talk, talk about them, but we can't live by them. It was the same Mashiach giving instruction that said, learn how to love indeed, but not with words. That means that if you're going to have impact on anybody, you can't be coming to them talking about thus thou said it. Would it? Should it? If, you know, you can't come quoting that stuff to people that don't believe the same thing. You have to learn how to allow those things that you believe to become the embodiment by ways and actions. This is a great problem that we have. We learned it from Christianity and they don't even understand how far off they are from the, from the words of the Most High. Because while many of them go to church and they'll plead the blood of Jesus in a minute, and I'm blessed and highly favored in a minute, but don't know anything about what the scripture says. So they can't even allow the words of scripture to become the embodiment of their actions because they have been taught to lean and to depend on a man that is at the ham. They have never been taught to stand on their own two feet, to be set apart and prioritize the reading and the studying and have an effective prayer life that the spirit can now regurgitate those things that they are learning. So we have learned a lot of falsehoods and all of these different type of things. And when we come amongst brothers and sisters that don't go to church, we try to reach them with church life and don't even understand that we are killing and thwarting our own purpose. Well, you have to be able to have a love for people that's greater than anything that, that they are part of in this physical world. Because at the end of the day, all of us are connected by blood and through life and being living. That is our common ground. And we're also connected because all of us one day are going to die. And when you die and you just had good relationships with people, they didn't know what you believe. What you believe is not for everybody else. What you believe is for you. And many times we tend to forget that what it is that we believe, it has less of an impact on us. Because we're too busy trying to persuade everybody else of what it is that we believe. And thereby we condemn ourselves because we go against the will of what the Most High have been telling us. I'm not against no man because he called himself a Christian. And I'm not with no man because he called himself an Israelite. I'm not against no man because he called himself a Muslim. For I got brothers that come out of Islam, that we are this close. I got some brothers that I could call up in a New York minute. And when we was young, we used to fight about that and debate about that. You know what, you Christian niggas, boy, y'all. We used to fight about that. We used to debate about that when we was young. But those things never drew wedges between us. Because if if the thing that you believe in causes it to, to destroy whatever opportunity it is that you have. Now, I identify with the fact that everybody ain't going to believe what you believe. But let me ask you a question. When people don't believe what you believe, does that mean that you stop living amongst them? That's a good question. You know what? Because as simplistic as these principles are, we're about to witness that. We're about to witness that. We have brothers and sisters that have stopped associating with the very people that the Most High to give them to live their life with. Because some man put a title on a particular day. 
And you got brothers and sisters that say that they serve in the Most High, that they believe in the Most High. Well, when you look in the Bible, let's look at one of the things that the so-called apostle did. He entered into a place to where the people didn't believe nothing but falsehoods and nothing but idols. And I had all kind of idol gods and everything that, that they was worshiping and all of these different things. Did that have an impact or effect on him? Did that make him stop and say, well, I ain't going in there. I ain't going in there because they got a Christmas tree up. No, these people didn't have a Christmas tree up. They had a multiplicity of gods and idols up that they were worshiping that were far worse than any of that. But you understand this, is that when you really understand your purpose, you understand that you can go into any arena in any atmosphere when you allow what you believe. Those words and those things that you have come to believe to be the, become the embodiment of your actions. And you understand that the reason why these things was given to me is so that I can act them out in my life, not so that I can talk about them. So it's appointed to every man once to die. If we think we that righteous, come on here. Come on here, if you think you're so righteous that you're going to miss the graveyard, put a seven up in there. And I guarantee you, it ain't one person that's going to put a seven up there. If you're so righteous that you don't have nothing that the Most High can judge you for in your life, put a seven up there. And I guarantee you, ain't nobody going to put a seven up in there. But if that be the case, if you, if you got things in your life that's going to bring you into death, because the flesh is simple. If you got things in your life that the Most High can judge you for, where would you ever find any time to pass judgment on anybody, no matter what they believe? Where would you find time to pass judgment on the Jehovah Witness because you are Israelite, but you are Israelite that have sin in your life? Where would you find time to pass judgment on the Israelite Christian, if you're a Christian going to church on Sunday, but you still have sin in your life and you still have things that the Most High can bring you into judgment for, where in the world would you, Israelite or Christian, have the capacity to pass judgment on the Muslim that believes in Allah when you, Christian and Israelite, both have sin in your life and things in your life that the Most High can judge you for? Where could the Christian, the Islamic man that will drop a bomb on somebody that don't believe what he believes, where would the, 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 the Muslim, the Israelite, and the Christian, where would they find the time to pass judgment on the man that believes in Buddhism, secularism, humanism, mono, uh, monoism, monotheism, atheism, all of these different worldviews, where would they find the time to pass judgment on anybody that don't believe what they believe when they have sin in their own life and they have things in their life that the Most High can judge them for? Where would anybody that's going to church, going to a mosque, or going to a Hebrew gathering find the time to judge anybody? Where could the Israelite find the time to judge the Christian about a Christmas tree when he believes in his heart that the 25th of December is the representation of Christ's birthday, even though the Israelite doesn't believe it? Where does he have the time to pass judgment on him when he cannot operate Operate by the things that the Most High have instructed him to operate by. He can't operate by the Sabbath. He can't operate out of the love. He can't operate by any of the things that the Most... He can't operate according to the new moons, according to the feast days. He can't operate according to the Levitical law or none of the things that the Most High instructed. Where would he find time to pass judgment on anybody? So our common ground have to come from some other things that would bring cohesiveness within the body and within the family. And you don't worry about where other people are. You make sure that you are lined up in the place that you are supposed to be. My father used to always say this, don't worry about the mule going blind. Keep your own ass in line, our own ass as in 
and jackass. One had a mule and one had a jackass, which are two of the same animals. He said, why worry about what your neighbor is doing, Christian? Why do you worry about the Israelite? Why do you always have a sermon to preach on the prostitute when you are drunk? Why do you always have a sermon to preach on the drunk when you do drugs? Why do you always have a sermon to preach on the drug addict when you got bitterness and anger and unforgiveness and self-righteousness down in your own heart? Israelite, why do you harp on the Christian because of a holiday? Why do you harp on the Christian because of going to church? Why do you harp on the Christian because of listening to the pastor even though many things are wrong? Why do you harp on him when you ain't done this that I told you? You ain't done that that I told you. You ain't done this that I told you. And you can't even recognize that you are still in the place of your captivity because of your disobedience. Why do you harp on these things? Why do we all harp on them? It's because we have allowed ourselves to forget how to live. And I'm not passing judgment on my brothers. I am showing you that when it comes to ministry, the only ministry that any of us have is the things that's born out of our own life where the Spirit brings a conviction and then helps us to start trying to overcome some of these things. Many of the things that we talk about, that we teach about, they are not things that have been overcame. So we don't speak them as though we have arrived somewhere that we haven't arrived. We speak them because sometimes we are right in the midst of a struggle and we know that there are other people that are right there and then when we understand these things and we find cohesiveness we all begin to grow together so it is you know when I was in the world when I was in the world when I was in the world well you know what when you close the door and close the door up under your house you see that you ain't never left the world the only thing you did is you transferred the foolishness that you was doing that everybody could see into a place that where could nobody see. It wasn't that you climbed over every hurdle. It wasn't that you overcame everything. It means that you portrayed yourself a certain type of way before people and now you have some of those same things but you can't show them things before people because we have sweared by the Most High's name. Because when we swear by the Most High's name, we don't want people to see our sin. Because it condemns us before the people that we swear to. But that's what the book said it would do. He that can't be believed without swearing by the name of the Most High, he have already condemned himself and he can't be believed. Now, if I got somebody on this thread, tell me that when you close your door in your house that you don't have no shame up under there. Tell me. Come back and put a seven up there and tell me that you ain't got no shame up under your roof. That's why the old folks used to say, what goes on in my house, it stays in my house because my house kept me protected from the shame. And if that is the case, how can you leave a house that protect you from shame and then come out into the world amongst your brothers and sisters and then can't see nothing but their shame? It's something that don't matter. It don't line up. But this is the condition. This is the condition that I found myself in. And this is the condition that I still find myself in. Sometimes I have to check myself when I want to look at other people. Well, you know, that ain't right. They shouldn't be doing it. I have to check myself because if I look close enough, I'll see some things that ain't right in my own life that I ain't got no business doing. And that's what you're talking about, living. Because that'll make you start keeping your mouth closed. If we open our lips wide on our brothers, then the most high going to allow all of us to be exposed. And this is why not just is not just limited to Christianity, but it's more prevalent with the preachers and the pastors in Christianity than it is amongst anybody else. You know why? Because by swearing and taking the Most High's name in vain, they have portrayed themselves as having a monopoly on the Most High's program. Well, you need a covering. You need a covering. Well, you need to go to church. Well, anybody that gonna go to church, they done fell away from the faith and they on their way to hell. Who told you that they was on their way to hell? Have you looked in the mirror lately? Because just because you go there, you 
you could be the one on the way to hell because you have forgotten what the responsibility is and what is the embodiment of the things that you say that you believe in rather than trying to condemn everybody and tell everybody what's going to happen, what ain't going to happen, where they going to go, who it's going to happen to, and looking for anything in somebody else's life to try to build a sermon on to elevate yourself when you yourself is in a shameful position. That don't fly. See, the Christian ain't no greater than the one that call himself an Israelite. He ain't no greater than the person that don't believe nothing. Because if love is not the embodiment, if love is not the embodiment and the grand sum total of your actions, it don't matter. Now, we showed you in the scripture, we showed you in the scripture in the uh, a scene gospel of peace, where those was not Paul's words that he quoted. When he start talking about, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love, I've become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. That means that if you speak in, in tongues, like our church brothers do, with the tongues of men and angels, like our Hebrew brothers do, running around speaking in Hebrew, I'm not knocking it. I'm just giving examples. He said, if I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I don't have love, I become like, like a drum set. That all the drums is gone. How can you make music just hitting a cymbal? You can't make music. He said, but this is what it's like because my words will become meaningless if they're not supported by my actions. It never was meant for the words to be spoken. That's why he mentioned this first as one of the most important things. It's your mouth. You're speaking. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels, it matters not how knowledgeable you are because you can speak with the tongue of men and understand the language of men, but to understand the tongues of angels is talking about a greater intelligence, a multiplicity of speeches. You got some people on the earth that speak American, speak English, speak Spanish, speak German, speak Russian, speak French. You got some people that can speak with the tongues of men and some people that can speak with the tongues of angels. But those will not be the things that determine how impactful they are when it comes to the Father's will. He said, if I don't have love, if what I'm doing ain't guided by my love for the brethren, he said, I'm like a drum set with no drums and I'm trying to make music. And this is what many of our ministries is like. The clanging cymbal is only one piece it's only one piece, and you can't make music with that. And when, this is the mindset that you have. When you have a Christian type of mindset that you don't associate with anybody outside of Christianity, you have become that symbol. When you have this mindset as an Israelite, this is what you're doing. You are one symbol. You ain't making no music. He said, listen, though I can bestow all my goods on the poor, I can give my body to be burned. If I don't have love, if love is not the motivation, now you're talking about sacrifice. You're talking about sacrifice now. Because listen, let me tell you something. I don't talk about Christianity from the standpoint of trying to tear nothing down. I speak on it because the, the, the Father had blessed me and allowed me to be an intricate part of it that understands the workings of it inward and outward. Now you're talking about sacrifice. Though I can bestow my goods upon the poor and then give my body to be burned if I is not motivated out of love. See, when you start talking about Christianity, you're talking about making a sacrifice. Oh, yeah, I can make the sacrifice. Oh, if you if I got an idea that you're going to end up coming to my church, I'll help you pay your light bill. I'll get you some groceries. You understand what I'm saying? We'll make sure that the church van come to pick you up. But when you start talking about somebody that ain't got no intentions on coming to church, when you start talking about somebody that's out there on crack or somebody that's in a bad condition, bad situation, when you're talking about them coming to the church, trying to get some help, trying to get you to 
make a sacrifice. Ain't no sacrifice going to be made because it ain't motivated out of love is not the driving force. When love is the driving force, you don't have no lines of distinction that run between who the people are and where the people come from. But this is how it is with this organization. And it is the same way with the Hebrew Israelite people. If the sacrifice, I will make the sacrifice for any of the brothers that are willing to come in, that are sit at my feet and believe what I'm going to believe. But let a let a Christian, a Christian, a Christian that's celebrating Christmas come over and start trying to glean something off an Israelite brother and watch what happened. Watch what happened. And you know why he lose the ability to have an impact? Because he don't have no desire to show or express love. To anybody outside of what it is that he believed. Yet he calls himself the chosen one. He calls himself the chosen one. Displaying the righteousness of the most high. But do it, is it that we don't know? Have we just become despisers of the fact that it's the most high's mercy and his goodness and his long suffering and his forbearance that leads a man to repentance? Listen, these, these are just some... Off the top, simplistic principles. You see, when early on, early on, I had beauty shops all my life. When people came to get their hair cut, it didn't make no difference where they came from. They had to listen to my Christian rap. They had to listen to my words. I remember one particular day I was doing a lady's hair. And I started talking to her about fornication. And it turned her off so bad that she said, I don't even want to hear no more. So I couldn't do nothing but respect what she said. But I was forcing what I believed on people. Grant you, in my mind and in my heart, I was desiring to minister and do things that would be productive. I did not understand. These things were not productive. They were stagnating my growth because they were causing me not to be able to live amongst the brothers and the sisters in the world that the Most High meant for me to be a light to. The using of these words and quoting the scriptures and pulling out Bibles on everybody when it came to people and I was mandating that these things be done and I felt like this. Well, the Most High gave me this gift to cut hair, and he made me so good at it that even though they don't want to hear it, they got to come in and sit down and listen to it anyway. Now, that was the Most High's mercy because they didn't have to come in and sit down and listen to nothing. They could have just got turned off and left. But see, these things happen for a reason because these are some of the things... That the most high was showing me. I'm harping on women about, oh, you know, girl, that skirt's too short. That skirt's too short. Listen, it wasn't even a year ago that I just was climbing out of some other woman's bed and was married. It was a year. It, I, it, still many things in my life that I hadn't even begun to overcome yet. Still doing. And those are the things that the Most High used to bring me real low. He said, okay, you want to harp on everybody because you think this is how you're going to reach them? Let me show you. Let me roll this. Let me roll this ghost of your past back out here. Let me put these drugs back out here on you. Let me put this fornication, this adultery back out here on you. And before you know it, lo and behold, I was back to my old foolishness. I was back to my old foolishness and when I came around those people and those people would see me back to my old foolishness that I had gotten on their nerves quoting scriptures and always talking about what they was doing I held my head down in shame and many of you are going to go through the same thing if you're not careful because that's not how the most high mean for us to reach anybody what you believe is for you. You believe that and then allow what you believe to become the embodiment of the person that you are while you walk in the world. But what you believe, just because you believe it, don't mean that everybody else going to believe it. But even if they don't believe it, ain't no greater thing that could ever happen to one that believes whatever it is that he believes. Ain't no greater thing for something to happen 
to the, the, the Christian that says what he believes. Ain't no greater thing that can happen to him. It's for somebody that's an atheist or somebody that's an Israelite to show up in his day of death and say, you know what? That was one of the most beautiful brothers I ever seen in my life. That brother came to my rescue on countless occasions. That brother, you know what, opened his door for me. That brother, you know, that brother exemplified love to me. There is no greater thing that can happen to an Israelite that believes that he had been chosen. There is no greater thing that can happen to him is for an atheist to speak on behalf of him. Yep, 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 that brother right there. He's a solid brother. He's a stand-up brother. He's a stand-up brother. For a Christian man to speak, man, he was a stand-up brother. Man, the man to give you a shirt off his back, the man would never, no matter what, how bad it was, you couldn't impress him with how bad it was. He could make you feel good by showing you something in his life that was far worse and, and showing you how he's still living and he's still doing good. And if it can happen to him, it can happen to you. There ain't no greater thing that people can speak highly of you and don't know what it is that you believe. But you have found a way to have cohesiveness with people that come from all walks of life. That when it come down for people to testify on your behalf, they will do that. This is, um, you see, our brothers, our brothers, there is no, listen, there ain't no big eyes, no little U's. There ain't no big eyes, no little U's. Nobody has no monopoly on anything. The Christian man say, you know, you ain't going to church and you ain't this, you ain't that, you're going to hell. The Israelite man say, well, if you ain't Israel, you ain't been chosen by God. You got to listen to me. You got to be brought in by me or, or you going to hell. The Torah sinner man can say, ain't no Jesus. Ain't no Jesus. Uh, you know, you know if y'all believing in Jesus, y'all worshiping the false God. He can say all of that. They can say all of those things. But the reality is, don't none of them have a monopoly on anything because ain't none of us. Ain't none of us lived up to the grand sum total of the most highest righteousness that he have committed to each one of us, no matter where you believe. Because whatever it is that you believe, that is where the spirit of the most high will meet you there to lead and guide you into truth. So if you're Israel, he will meet you there where your responsibility is. If you're a Christian, he'll meet you there where your responsibility is. If you're a Muslim, he'll meet you there where your responsibility is. If he'll meet you there where your responsibility is. And if where he meets you, you have not lived up to the grand sum total of what's required for you, then you don't have any time. You should let that common ground of being shameful and sinful be what brings cohesiveness between the brothers at large because all of us have that same issue. We all have that same issue. You see? And the thing is, is that sometimes we get so graveled up and preoccupied with life that we forget that we're going to die one day. We're going to die one day. And then it's going to be time for us to be judged. But I tell you the honest to God truth. When I stand before the Most High, I want the Most High to have mercy on me. Because I know what my life is like. When y'all see me, y'all just see me on the camera. You see? Y'all see me on the camera. You don't see me when I go into my house and when I close the door and I'm gone in for the evening. Uh, some days are glorious and some days I can just be thankful and some days I can just love my wife and some days I can just be still and be at peace but there are some days like a dog returns to his vomit I find myself returning to my old same old shameful ways I have to thank the most high in the quietness of my spirit and in the confines of my space for protecting and covering me up but Lord forbid when I leave my house I forget those things. Like James said, a man, a man that has unrighteousness in him is like a man that goes and looks himself in the face in the mirror and then he beholds all of the things that are wrong with him. But immediately, as soon as he walk away from the mirror, he forget what type of man he was. And that is the condition 
of many of our brothers and sisters, when you walk away from the mirror, the mirror is the spirit of conviction that looks back at us, that shows us who we really are up under the, up underneath the most highest word, because his word don't belong to us. His word does not belong to us. It covers us. But the spirit is the mirror that looks back at a man and shows us everything that we are not. He said, the unrighteous man is this type of man. Soon as he walks away, he forgets those things that are unrighteous that the spirit just convicted him about. And now he only have eyes to look at everything that everybody else is doing that is unrighteous. That is a place of pure wickedness. And that is one of the areas that we're going to find ourselves being judged in. So if you, if you don't have a life that's spotless, the sinless, you don't have no business in the world trying to look at what nobody else is doing. Now, if somebody come and asks you a question, that's something different because you can expound on that question and you can answer that question according to what it is that you believe. You see, it's one thing for somebody to come and say, hey, brother, you know what? I, you know, I notice when everybody else is doing these things, you don't do them. So, so tell me, you know, did you ever celebrate Christmas and, and and why don't you celebrate Christmas now? Somebody come and ask you a question, I can expound to them that. Well, you know, yeah, I used to be like everybody else. I used to put up a Christmas tree every every year. I used to buy my kids Christmas gifts, but you know, one day one day I was challenged to read the Bible and I start reading on a particular area and I found out that 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 Easter was not what we thought it was in the Bible. And so it made me curious and I kept reading. And that's where I start finding out that Christian was not right. And uh, I mean, Christmas and all of these different things was not biblical. They were things like that. You see, that makes a big difference when somebody asks and you can explain to them because they genuinely want to know. And what they do with the information after that is on them. But there is a way to do everything because you don't have no monopoly on nothing. And you can't be the judge because you don't know how the most high going to affect nobody's life in the future. You can't see the future. You will not know the future that the most high have for nobody else's life. And this is where we go wrong at. There are many brothers and sisters I was clubbing over the head, clubbing over the head. Only to find out that five years later, they would be worshiping. Five years later, they would be speaking. Five years later, they would be. And then I ran back like, like I was something that I had something to do with it. Yeah, I remember I used to minister to them, you know. I used to minister to them back in the day. I used to min Hey man, look, you're not gonna tell me what ain't real. I I know what's real. And everybody go through the same process of growth. Children will be children. Everybody that's on milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. And when you first start learning the word, these are the things that you do because you're on milk. And if the book say that when you're on milk, you're unskillful, it means that you don't understand how to use what it is that you got. And if you don't believe what's being said, only thing you got to do is when this video in, you go to your Facebook uh, feed, news feed, live feed, and you start scrolling down and you will see all the people that's on milk, unskillful in the word as they attack everything. Everybody else but themselves. So, but it's appointed to us once to die, and we have lost our brothers. And even as uh, even as we lost my brother-in-law's brother, we all grew up from children. Yesterday, we lost him yesterday, and while I sit there. And looked at that, that lifeless body. All of those memories came flooding back. I never knew him to be a church member. I never heard him claim that he was a Hebrew Israelite. I never knew anything dealing with him from a religious standpoint. But one thing that I can say about Willie D. Randolph 
is that Willie D. Randolph was a righteous man. I can say that I never seen him disrespect anybody. I can say that every time he showed up, he showed up with something in his hand. That every time he showed up, he brought a smile to the faces that he was around. Every time he showed up, that is what I remember. I can remember that people would come to his house on a regular basis. Many of them would spend the night. But he was the type of person that people were always around. I can remember that he was a man that got his children at an early age and was a single parent father taking care and raising his children from babies all the way to now. I can remember the righteous man that he was as he took care of his responsibility and his children, as he went to work on a daily basis, had his own house, had his own cars, and had his own responsibility, I can remember that he was righteous. I don't know what he believed. And it don't matter. Because whatever it is that you say that you believe should come out in your own life. And I was encouraged by that because our Christian mindset had led us to believe that anybody that wasn't in church, that anybody that wasn't confessing the Messiah as Lord, that anybody that wasn't doing those things was destined to hell. And when I got up this morning, the Most High reminded me of something that I read in the Bible. He said, there are people Israel, that have laws that they cannot live by or do not live by. And there is another group of people that have no written laws, but they have become a law to themselves and they walk in righteousness, in the Father's righteousness on the earth, even though they don't have no book that they're reading on a daily basis. That helps us to be able to draw lines of distinction between who's doing what and who's going where. You ain't going nowhere just because you say that you believe in something. What you say you believe is going to have to be acted out in our life. And that gave me comfort where my brother is concerned. And many of the brothers, just like myself, as we try to break the barrier of religiosity, which we don't want to identify with it, because our Hebrew brothers, we, we, are, we don't want to identify with the fact that we have turned the Israelite heritage into a religious thing. We don't want to identify with that. You know how something has been turned into a religious thing because you're no longer concerned about the root of a thing and what was supposed to come out of it. We're only concerned about outward expression and swearing by the Most High's name. As we put our fringes on and swear by the Most High's name, we'll put our fringes on mixed fabric and breaking the law and trying to uphold the law. At the same time, I'll put my fringes on a shirt that is 50% cotton and 50% polyester and I'll gloat about praising and gloat about keeping the law and breaking the law all at the same time. I'll gloat about keeping a feast day. I'll gloat about keeping the Sabbath when I steal on Facebook. Keeping the Sabbath when I still turn a TV on. Keeping the Sabbath when I still talk on the phone. Keeping the Sabbath when I still drive two miles to get to a Sabbath teaching class and we'll gloat about keeping the law while breaking the law at the same time, the same way that the Christian will go in there and get Give thanks on Thanksgiving and thank the Most High on Thanksgiving and not understand that Thanksgiving is pagan. He'll gloat about thanking the Most High while breaking his law at the same time as he put a Christmas tree up. He'll gloat about this is the day of Jesus' birth. But when the truth come of the Spirit to show you that cut not, they cut a tree down out of the forest. When the Spirit shows you the word of God, you'll gloat about the, the goodness of the Father while breaking his law and breaking these things at the same time and then we'll turn our evil eye toward our brothers and we'll look at them as though they're the ones with the problem 
And we have completely forgot that today could be the last time that you will hear anything from your brothers, anything from your sisters. We'll gloat about that. Look at our brothers, on, look at our Hebrew brothers, look at our Israelite brothers right now. And I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong. I'm saying that what you're saying, you better check yourself before you do say it. And if you can look in a mirror and the spirit can bring conviction into your life concerning your sin, then you better be careful of the next post that you put out there aimed at your brother. But we know that's not going to happen. And what that becomes, that becomes a manifestation before the brothers and sisters that are on looking, that he who swear by the name of God, and you swear by the name of God in many ways, not just using his name, not just using his name. Because if you look at Exodus 6 and 3, it said he appeared, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the Lord God Almighty, but my name was not known to them. Say no man that know the true name of the most high. If he didn't tell his name to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are you thou better than your forefathers? I know what's in the book, but I know also what's being said. Are you better than that? So he's not talking about the name. You ain't swearing by the name that be given because every name that was given to the Messiah is not his name. It is a description of his facet. Thou shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people. You're putting a name onto his name that identifies what his name embodies. His name is the embodiment of bringing salvation. Thou shall call his name Yahshua because it means the Lord saved. His name is the the name that's put on him is the embodiment of what he came to do. He shall be called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And on his thigh was written the name, the name King of Kings. Well, the King of Kings was not his name. The King of Kings was a description of what his name embodied. So when you start talking about swearing by the name of the Most High, we're not talking about somebody just saying, oh, oh, Jesus, oh, Lord, have mercy. Oh, you know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about when you take the things that are connected to his righteousness and then apply them to whatever it is that you're doing. Then you condemn yourself because there is none of us that have arrived at the sum total of the most high's righteousness. And we're following men that have portrayed themselves as righteous before other men and have other men following other men. So these are, uh, you know, I just, you know, that death factor, that death factor is something. If you know that if the most high called your life into judgment, Today, all praises, all praises while we teaching the lesson, because when we teaching the lesson or when we're speaking in this wise, then we use what it is that we know. I'm not talking about teaching no class, not saying the most high. I'm talking about when you start relating what, what you have learned and your responsibility to people. That's what I'm talking about. When stuff start going out, I'm not talking about when it's coming in. Our praises because praises is coming in as the most high deal with us. They coming in because we understand his mercy is new every day. And if he woke me up this morning, that means that I see new mercy and I can't be held as a captive to what I done yesterday. But his mercy is being given to me today for a reason. Because he know at some point throughout the course of the day, I am going to need it. His mercy is new in the lives of all of the people on the planet on a daily basis. It's there for two reasons. One, so that nobody can hold us captive to what we did yesterday. And for two, so that we can be protected and covered. For whatever we might fall into today, that is against them. And if every person on the planet is in that condition right there to where you need to exercise the mercy of the Most High 
on a daily basis? Where would the room come to exercise judgment or unmercifulness on anybody? You don't know what day you're going to die. You could be in the best of health. You don't know. Choke on the chicken bone. Fall down a flight of steps. You see, you, you don't know how you're going to die. Heart could just stop. Air could just, just go. Have an asthma attack. You don't know. None of us know. Car accident, plane crash, anything while we're in route can bring us into the Father's presence any day now. What are the people going to have to say about you when it's time for your life to expire? What are the people going to have to say? Is anybody in there going to even want to get up and speak on your behalf? And those people that do speak on your behalf, on your behalf would they have to lie about you? Yeah, yeah, that was my nephew. I loved him. I loved him. But you know what? He, every, time, every time he came around, he just came around with all that nonsense and all that Hebrew Israelite stuff and just getting on everybody's nerve and, and this and that. What are the people going to say that will have something to say? Will they have to get up there and lie about you? And then when everybody get home, yeah, you know what? And I tell you, it was a self-righteous hypocrite. Because y'all yeah, know, I know he be in church shouting and dancing and then turn around and cuss you out as soon as you get out of there. He didn't treat his wife right. I know he in church, he on the deacon board, standing up there on the deacon board. And no good and well, he cheating on his wife. And the pastor ain't no good because he know exactly what that deacon doing. He know exactly what he doing. What, what are they going to have to say about you? Would they have to lie about you? And then after it's all over, they'll talk and talk the truth about you? What are they going to have to say about you when it's time for you to die? What are your children going to have to say? Well, your children going to have to be able to say, well, you know, one thing I can say about my daddy, my daddy, my daddy loved us. My daddy loved us. My daddy cared about us. My daddy. What are your children going to have to say about you? Yeah, they you had everybody food. They had everybody food. I done heard some kids. I done heard some kids. I done heard some kids because we ain't always been where we at now. You see, my kids used to mock people that was in church. And I used to get on them, but I come to understand that children moved by things that were true. And they used to mock people and make fun of people while they was in church. Because they would see them doing one thing on the floor of the church and then see them doing something else in the life. But it wasn't no strange thing because guess what? They seen their mother and their father do the same thing. They would see their mother and their father up there trying to praise the Lord, singing in the choir and sitting on the deacon board and all of that mess. They'll see them doing that Sunday and then come home to a house full of hell or arguing and screaming and going to the lawyers trying to get divorced and all that. They have seen those things. They've seen them. What are the people going to have to say about you when it's time for you to die? Some of you have separated from your own children because you can't force feed them and they keep throwing up what you're trying to stick or cram down their throat. What are they going to have to say about you, Christian man, Israelite man, as you take a spoon and try to cram stuff down people's throat that you yourself ain't even learned how to live by? What are they going to have to say about you? What are they going to call you a self-righteous hypocrite? Yeah, he had the fringes on. Yeah, he had the garments on and running around here trying to speak in a Hebrew language that can't nobody understand except the friends that he are hanging with like he's doing something. He done made himself seem like he better than everybody else when, when his butt ain't even got a job. He's still out there fornicating. He ain't got no wife and always talking about Yahoo and this, Yahoo and that. What are they going to have to say about you, Israelite, so-called Israelite man? What are they going to have to say about you when you close your eyes for the last time and give up the ghost? Who's going to stand up and testify that he wasn't a perfect man. He wasn't a perfect man, but he was a righteous man. And righteousness don't mean that he was perfect, but I've seen him treat people good. I've seen him loving people. I've seen him caring for people that didn't believe what he believed in. I've seen him exemplifying the goodness of the Most High, even though we never knew he was a Hebrew, a Hebrew Israelite. We never seen him wear fringes, but we did see him put clothes on the person's back that didn't have none. We didn't see him going to his Sabbath classes, but we did see him go and donate money to the Salvation Army. We did see him uh, look after his brothers. We did see him do those things. What are they going to say about you? 
What are they going to say about you, Muslim man, that have come to believe that anybody that don't believe in a rock is doomed? What are they going to say about you? Will they be able to say that your faith brought you into a greater love for the brother? What are they going to be able to say about you, Muslim man, that have built mosques on every place? What are they going to be able to say about you, Muslim man, that can't identify with a Christian because of what he believes, that can't identify with an Israelite because of what he believes, that can't identify with nobody else? What are they going to say about you, Muslim man, that believe that everybody that don't believe in a rock is doomed. What are they going to say about you? When it's your time to hit the dirt. I don't know about nobody else and I can't speak for nobody else. But I often wonder. I often wonder every time that I go to a funeral, I see myself laying up there in the box and I envision what are people going to have to say about me? What they call me a self-righteous hypocrite because when I went in the club, I was too righteous to have me a shot of Jack Daniels with the rest of the cowboy brothers. What are they going to say about me? What they call me a self-righteous hypocrite because every time I came around, I was talking about Jesus or talking about Yahweh shot. But at the same time, I wouldn't treat my wife good. What are they going to have to say about me? Are they going to be able to tell good stories that, that he wasn't a perfect man, but we've seen him do the best that he can with his life. He wasn't selfish with his money. What, what are they going to say? What are they going to say? I often wonder, what would they say about me? What would they say about you? Because it ain't about what you say you believe. If what you say you believe can't be exemplified with the life that you are living, then you are esteemed worse than a perjurer and you have condemned yourself. What are they going to say about you when the Most High take our breath away? Is anybody going to cry? Is anybody going to mourn? Is anybody going to weep? When they come and bring you, when they come before the people and say, he have taken his final breath, how are people going to be affected? Will they be rejoicing? Well, I knew he wasn't going to last. I knew he was going to die early. How many, how many people had swore and said, you'll be lucky if you live to see the age of 21. What are they going to say about you when it's time for you to die? Because grant you, it is appointed to man, every man wants to die. After this is judgment. And the judgment is dealing with what are the people going to say? Because the people, when it's time for judgment, you will understand that the people are the most important thing. They are the ones that will stand when you go to the court system and your case has to be heard. The Messiah said, even in your courts, it said two or three witnesses must corroborate a thing to substantiate the truth. When it's time for judgment, there will be witnesses there. There will be people to witness and testify before the Most High on behalf of your deeds. Whether they be righteous deeds or whether they've been righteous acts that were not coupled by a pure motive. What are the people going to say? Yeah, he did it for me. He did it for me. But, but I, had to, I had to tell him my whole life story before he did. He did it. But he complained every step of the way. And he griped about it. And every time I called him, he was disappointed to hear from me. And any time I needed him, he had to complain. Oh, I got to come over there. Man, why don't you get yourself together? Why don't you give your life to God? Why don't you give your life to Jesus? You need to stop this fool and get your... Why you can't just go and do what's asked of you without trying to become somebody's instructor on what they need? need to do and let your actions and your deeds become the embodiment of what you believe. What are they going to say about you? I don't care how many times that I called him and I done him wrong on several occasions. I done him wrong. I even stole from him. But I don't care when I called him. It was like he treated me like those things had never happened. He always loved me. He loved me to the point to where it made me feel bad just to go around him, just to look into his eyes and see how I have done him and how he still treat me. What are they going to say about you? 
What are they going to say? What are they going to say? Will they have to get up there and lie? Yeah. We have what you call idiosyncrasies. They are character defects. And in most cases, the idiosyncrasy is like the main thing that stands out that everybody can see. They might say, yeah, man, I'll tell you one thing. Boy, I tell you, that boy used to get on my nerves sometimes. I mean, he loved everybody to death, but boy, that boy, that boy's head was that big. He was so convinced about himself. See, we have idiosyncrasies. And the idiosyncrasy is the one thing that every person on the planet has, which is a character defect. Yeah, he was good as gold. He was good as gold. But boy, you better not rub that joke in the wrong way. He's going to let you have it right then and there. He's still going to love you, but he's going to let you have it. And, and everybody can just bust out laughing. They say, boy, you sure right. Those are what you call idiosyncrasies. And those are the things that give all of the people that will come together to testify of you. It will give them all common ground because they will all recognize that same thing. Yeah, boy. Yep, yep. He was good, but it was one thing that used to kill me, man. Man, that joker could start laughing, and before you know it, his laugh was so crazy and so corny that everybody else would be laughing just because of him laughing. And that's how, you see, those are idiosyncrasies. They give everybody that is round to testify of us common ground. They can all identify with one particular thing that came out of that individual. And it don't make no difference whether you be an individual that had righteous acts or not. And I'm telling you the honest to God truth. I'm going to tell the truth. I'm going to tell the truth, period. If the spirit prop my heart to get up there, and I remember when, one of my, when my uncle passed away. God rest his soul. And I love my uncle. I mean, my daddy's brother, and they used to play dominoes and everything. But, man, when we was coming up as children, even into my grown age, man, my uncle remained the meanest dude I ever knew. And when we came to that funeral, and we remembered my uncle, and my uncle was a deacon in church. He was in the Masonic Lodge, and he was all of that. But my uncle was terrible. He used to jump on his wives and stuff like that, and that sucker was downright mean. I mean, he'll hang you out to dry as a kid. He'll hang you out to dry. And he will not tell you, but one time, he was just straight mean just when you looked at him. He was mean. And I got up there and I remembered my uncle because he wasn't just all mean. We had some good laughs. He used to tell me as a kid, Michi Rini, Michi Rini. That's what he used to call me, Michi Rini. And, and I said, you know what? I know our uncle loved us, you know. And, man, we used to play dominoes, and him and my daddy, and we used to get joy out. I said, but my uncle was the meanest man I ever knew. As a kid, and even as a grown man, he was mean. He had good deeds, and he had some righteous acts along the way. But everybody could identify with the fact that this dude was just straight mean. And I don't know if his meanness just came from how he grew up or whatever. But I'm telling you the honest to God truth. When it's time for you to die, what kind of testifying is going to happen on your behalf? And many of us don't even take the time to think about dying. So we never become preoccupied with how we live it. But I'm telling you the honest to God truth. I just felt like this was one that needed to be, it needed to be said. Because when I take my last breath, I want people to say, you know what? I want, that's what I would desire them to say. I want them to be able to say that, you know what? He just loved people. Or he wasn't perfect, but he was trying to live by the things that he knew. 
I would like people to be able to remember, man, I remember that joker when he first started learning that Bible, man, he used to get on everybody's nerve, talk about everybody, talk about our dresses being too short, he's talking about the brothers fornicating, talking about, he talking about everything that he could see in somebody's life that was wrong, he would light in on you, and it didn't make no difference who was there, I was watching him try to clean the whole corner up, he want to take the, take the bottle from the wine nose, he want to take the, the weed, he want to take everything. He want to condemn everybody around. He said, I remember when he was like that. But as he got older, those things just changed. And he became somebody pleasant to be around. Have I arrived at that point yet? I don't think I have. I don't think I have. Though I know a lot of people. I don't think I have arrived at the point to where I am pleasant to be around people all the time like that. So I know this because I got to go home. When my wife feels like that, my husband is pleasant to be around because nobody knows a man like his wife. And I always say, if you want to know what kind of man a man is, look at the expression on his wife. The expression on my wife's face sometimes will tell you that she's disappointed in me. The expression on her face will sometimes tell you that she feels left out, that she feels second, that she feels forgotten about. Sometimes the expression that's on my wife's face will tell you that, that she feels underappreciated. This is, I'm being honest. We don't always know how to fix things. You see, Men want to fix things. When my home gets to the point to where when my wife look at me, she sees, she's, all of you see is pleasantness that she is glad that I'm there. That, that's what, when my wife feels like that, when my wife still feels the same way, grant you, I'm telling you, my wife loved me, just like many of your wives love you. But they don't always feel appreciated. Sometimes they feel like they've been taken advantage of. And let the truth be told, sometimes we do take advantage of them because they're our wives. We don't mean to, but we don't always know how to fix it. And so even sometimes we try to fix it and we create a bigger mess. Because we don't know how to fix it. But these are the measuring sticks that the Most High give us. So that we can be able to put a measurement on our effectiveness or whether it is that we're getting done what's supposed to be done. The, the book says, he that don't assume the care and responsibility for his own house is worse than an unbeliever. That means that the whole world can be pleased with me. And the whole world can have things to say about me. But if the one the Most High gave me to spend my life with is displeased and unhappy and miserable, then that means that there is something terribly wrong with me. And sometimes when I go in my house and I look in the mirror and I look at my wife's face, I understand there is something terribly wrong with me. Because if she is not pleased, then there is no way that I can lay claim to the fact of the pleasantness that grips people. When I come around, if the one that I'm living with does not feel that pleasantness, it don't matter how many brothers in the Hebrew Israelite community feel that pleasantness when the so-called elder come around or how many of my brothers in Christianity feel that pleasantness when I show up in church or pull up on them or how many of my Islamic brothers will feel that pleasantness when we can just get together and shop if my wife doesn't feel it. It is the ultimate measuring. Something is wrong. But we don't always know how to fix things. You see? So, I just, you know, I, I think it's important. We want to know. I don't, and I, one, one of the prayers that I pray to the Most High on a, uh, quite often 
It don't make no difference what I'm doing. If it's unlike him, I just say, please don't let me die in this condition. Please don't let me die in this condition. Please don't let me die in this condition. But what I think is a bad condition might be a condition that the most high mean for me to be in. It might keep you in a place that you need to be so that you don't become one that mistreats people. So, brothers and sisters, I wanted to be mindful of our brothers and sisters, and I'm not the only one, uh, you know. And I've been through quite a few funerals this year, but one thing I'm mindful of is that, you know, when that hearse drop one off, it's going to make a U-turn, and it's coming back through the neighborhood, and you don't know what house is going to stop at next. Could be my house. Could be your house, could be somebody else's house. But one thing we do know is that it's going to make another turn again. So, uh, and while it do, let's just be mindful. To my brothers and sisters in Kansas City, Missouri, once again, we want to let you brothers know that, that uh, our, our young king, Willie D. Randolph, my brother-in-law, George Randolph, big brother, had uh, passed away on yesterday, and then uh, we got we got the word that one of the brothers I used to work with, Big Fur, had passed away uh, too. So we want to keep those families lifted up in prayer, and above that, all of the people that's praying for lost loved ones, uh, above anything, that while you're praying, you also remember that tomorrow. It might be you. Remembering that it might be us tomorrow keeps us conscious of how we should be living today. And so if it's somebody that you rubbed the wrong way, if you're out of fellowship with your family because of some of these different things, you can still love people because they celebrate Christmas. You can still love people. It don't have nothing to do with you. It don't have anything to do with you. Because I always feel like this. The same way the Most High enlighten you, he can enlighten them. It's not your responsibility to enlighten everybody. But you can still love people that don't believe, that don't believe or don't accept the fact that they are Israelites. You can still love people that call themselves Christians. You can still love people that call themselves Muslim. You can still love people. That's doing things that's unlike what you do. Because once upon a time, all of these things that you have learned, they were here long before you got here. Before you ever wandered into the understanding or the information that you know, you was in the same place that those brothers and sisters, many of you have turned your backs on. You was in the same place. And if you can only see how the Most High is looking at you and how the Most High is looking at you with disbelief. You see, you don't. The people don't have to believe what you believe. In order for you to love them. As a matter of fact, if you really believe what you believe, that's all the reason in the world for you to love people in spite of. Period. So, good afternoon.